Uh, we have uh, a series that we've been working on, kind of this idea that we reassemble, we, are, we allow God to reassemble our lives. And we're really on what we call discipleship step number four. And one of the things that's interesting about discipleship step number four is that it is our correct view of God, having a correct view of God that allows God to reassemble your life. So think of it this way, all right? What we're really saying is, do I trust God enough to allow him to put me back together? Some of us live and we say, I'm not going to a counselor. Why? Well, your view of counselors is they're not really equipped. I don't want them messing with me. I don't trust them with my secrets. All right? And maybe you have some good reasons why. Uh, if you're like me, you know several bad counselors. But I also know several good ones. All right? And, 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 and one of the challenges then is you go and say, well, I let this person put me back together. Some of you have been in relationships where you came out of broken relationships, out of toxic relationships, and you were offering to this next person as you got to know them and date them, you said, hey, here's some pieces of my heart. I'm giving them to you, trusting that you're willing to put them back together. You only do that a few times before you say, I'm never trusting anybody with my heart again, right? Because I gave the pieces away and then they were broken again. <laughs> We just came out of a season where we were assaulted about it. Last Christmas, I gave you my heart. <clears throat> I was really worried about it there. It's like, <laughs> maybe I'm the only one who knows. I think it was on the radio like all the time. So I was a little worried. All right? And here's the point, is that, that ultimately what we're asking today is, do you trust God enough to put you back together? Let me give you an example of how that works or how it doesn't work. Okay, when we were young with our young kids, young, 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 when they were like you know down here, right? We would get Christmas presents out. Sometimes those Christmas presents needed a sound. The problem was is that in the rash of opening up the next Christmas present, sometimes as they had already opened the box, which I think don't open that yet, just leave it all right there, right? Come on. All right? You're like, this is there. Don't open it up, okay? We just, we'll come back to that one. Why? It's got a million parts, right? And the next thing you know, it's being open and there are parts. And then dad goes to put it together. And you have what? Missing parts. Right? And you can't assemble it. And then when you've assembled, you have to take apart and what? Reassemble because you didn't have the parts to assemble what you wanted to do in the first place. Because you're like, in the picture, it shows this and this. We don't even have that piece. And at least in my house, there was more than one Christmas where we went digging through the trash. Right? Of Here's wrapping paper. Oh, hey, here's what we were missing. Everybody, woo! Celebration, right? We can now put this together. This is how most of us do our relationship with God. God, you you can have everything. Yeah, but this piece over here, I don't know if I really trust you. In fact, let me give you a couple examples of that. Right? Your anger. Well, some of you know someone that did something so wrong that they deserve to have you mad at them. Right? And God, you can have every part reassemble my heart, reassemble my life. I just, I want to still stay angry. <laughs> okay, so you want me to reassemble you with missing pieces. Got it. Or God, I don't want to forgive that person. Wow. We'll come back to that. Well, God, I, I'm actually angry with you. Which is okay, by the way. God's never like, oh my gosh, don't be angry with me, please. I'm begging. All right, God's like, I'm big enough, I can handle it. Right? I, I'm your loving father. It's okay to be angry with me at times. We've got to work through that. Right? And it's, here's what I want to challenge you with today. Do you have a correct view of God? That you're saying to God, here's all my parts. In 2022, put me back together. Because again, somebody is going to reassemble you this year. Is it going to be the person who knows the end product, what it should look like? Or is it going to be you on your own? Is it going to be your girlfriend? Is it going to be a friend? Is it going to be a counselor? But just somebody's reassembling you this year. Who is doing the work? Right. I'm going to confess to you right away. We are not in Romans 8. We're in Matthew 8. And I put Romans in every slide. I don't know how I did that. 
All right, other than I was, I was looking at Romans earlier, and then when I did the slide, somehow Romans came over. It's Matthew 8. So just forgive me. Uh, we're in Matthew 8. Uh, if you got your Bible, you want to look at it. Interesting passage. Jesus has entered Capernaum, which, by the way, is Jesus' hometown. And so just a little history there for you. If someone says, what was Jesus' hometown? You can go, well, like where he grew up or where he eventually called his home base. Look how smart you sound. Capernaum is where he calls home base, all right? And so he uh, comes back home to Capernaum, and a centurion comes and asks him, Lord, my servant is at home paralyzed and suffering. Why is, is this interesting? Because if we don't get why this is interesting, we lose some of the power of what's going on. Some dude just comes up and asks Jesus for help. That's a different story. The story is a centurion came up and asked Jesus for help. Why is that so, like, should pay attention. Highlights here. Everybody pause. Centurion. Why is that a big deal? Anybody know? What? Well, yeah, Roman soldiers don't believe. Absolutely. Romans are polytheists, meaning they believe in all kinds of gods. One of the one of the points of contention between Rome was that if the Jews would just accept the Roman gods, Rome was okay accepting the Jewish God, but the Jews believed there was only one God. And all these others were excluded. In fact, they were one of the few cultures at their time who believed that. Everybody else said, eh, many gods. We don't know. Let's not offend anybody. The Jews said there was only one God. And the Christians then took that to say, and we know who that is. Okay? So we have that moment where a Roman centurion who doesn't believe in the one God apparently may be saying he believes in the one God. We're getting ahead of the story there, though. Why else would this be interesting? Let's cover some of the dynamics for me. All right. First of all, when you're a Jewish peasant, you don't normally have a good relationship with the enemy who's occupying your area. Okay, let me give you a couple examples why. Uh, and to help you understand, it would be like you're in France, the Nazis have invaded in World War II. They've been there so long that you're like, hey, you've learned to live under occupied territory, but you every day you know the enemy's here. And because of that, every day there's danger, and every day there's tension. Okay? And why is there tension? Well, you're in occupied territory, there's never true freedom. Right? And by the way, you can't stand up to them. You can't resist, you can't argue a case. What? They're bigger, they're stronger, they're tougher, and they'll just kill you. Okay? And so, uh, that's, who do the Roman soldiers guard? They guard the tax collectors. Do we like the tax collectors? If you're a Roman peasant or a Jewish peasant? No. Then why not? Well, because, first of all, they protect the tax collector who's cheating and stealing and taking your money, right? But also, if you can't pay taxes, what is what are the Roman soldiers now assigned to do? They're the ones who go in your house and get whatever, which may be the only food you have left to feed the family for that month. Or if you can't pay, they're not going to haul you as mom or dad off to debtor's prison. Because then they're never going to collect. Who will they take? Yeah, the kids. Now, not every Jewish family is missing kids. But in a town like Capernaum, that only has to happen to two or three families before, hey, we hate these people. And you live every, every tax season in fear. My daughter may come up missing. What? Because the Romans could just take them. And I can't do a thing about it. This is not your hero, in spite of what history says sometimes. The Jewish peasants absolutely hated the Roman soldiers. And so here we have a Roman soldier who's absolutely hated by the Jewish peasants, who's coming and asking the Jewish peasant for help. It's a fascinating role reversal that we should grab and go, I bet this story is going to be really interesting. And, and here we see immediately there's two versions of authority in a culture. And I love this because anytime I get a chance to just highlight on leadership, we should always stop and go, oh, wait, here's a little leadership lesson. All right. And uh, so we have one version of authority, which is, hey, I'm just bigger, stronger, tougher. You do what I say, I'm going to kick your tail. That's a version. By the way, this is a version of parenting that you can use. This is a version of uh, relationship dominance you can use. It's a version that you maybe have experienced from a boss. And so you have this, like, hey, I'm in charge. Do what I say, whether it's right or wrong, just do it because I'm in charge. Or there's the other version, which is the God of the Tower. 
Jesus said, if you want to see what I look like, you want to show people what I do, take a towel and go wash people's feet. I didn't mean walk around town washing people's feet. He meant serve others as I have served and loved you. But listen, just grounding this, it changes how you do marriage. It changes how you do parenting. Do your kids know you as the servant father? There's one thing to say, I care for my kids. There's another thing to say, I serve them. Does your spouse, does your husband, or does your wife, and again, both sides, do they, do they go, hey, it's a submission competition where we're out serving one another? All right? When you date, are you dating and expecting for that person to serve and care for you? And you serve and care for them, or are you expecting that you can dominate them or that they dominate you? Either or? I see again, this changes ever when we see the two forms of leadership side by side. It's just... Side note, this is a freebie, not directly connected to everything and anything, but just you know, I didn't want to pass by, okay? One of these is based on divine revelation. The other is based off of the kingdom mindset of the world. Okay. All right, so Jesus then, having been asked, hey, come here, my servant, says to him, and this is an interesting question. He's like, should I go or not? Now, why does Jesus say that? Because if you're reading the passage, all of a sudden you're like, that seems like a really odd thing for Jesus to ask. And who's he asking? Is he asking the Roman centurion who just asked? You know, Jesus turns around and says to the crowd, should I go or not? Now the reason Jesus asks is, again, we got to crawl back into the context. But again, I finally got Matthew on the screen. The rest of it's Romans. I don't know how I did that. Okay, I really don't. It's weird. All right? But Jesus uh, says, shall I come to him or not? And what we have to understand is that Jesus, when he was in the physical body, had limited ability. In the sense, if it's going to stay in the physical body, he can't be literally everywhere at once, right? And so while you and I have a God who's outside of time, space, and matter, when Jesus became incarnate, he was in the physical body, which means he can only be where his physical body is, right? And so Jesus can't be everywhere at once. And so what we see is Jesus' ministry starts mainly in Jerusalem, all right, and the Judea area. But while his ministry ultimately is going to be for all people everywhere, uh, Jesus is limited at this time to just kind of, hey, here's who I can reach in the physical body. All right? And one of the things that we don't see Jesus do is interact much with Gentiles. Now, we do see it with like the lady at the well, the Samaritan lady at the well. We see other instances. But Jesus' ministry is mainly the Jews. And again, he says, I want to send you to Jerusalem, Judea, to the Samaria, to the end of the world. So the mission was to everybody. But mainly to the Jews at the moment. And now here's a non-Jew who is the enemy who has come up and asked for a healing for one of his servants. And I see a story. And again, you kind of see the social dynamics. And you can even see people in the back, like are you like, hey, hey, she's she's that's wrong. That's the enemy. Let that servant die. Why would you go heal him? Jesus, you shouldn't even be talking to him. He's a Roman soldier. Do you know just last week, they took my cousin's daughter? Jesus, don't do this. But what's a Roman soldier risk? As you said, he could actually be kicked out of the army. Out of service for asking this Jewish peasant for help. What? And what we see is that there's this amazing moment where the Jewish soldier recognizes the authority, the identity of the one that he's asking the help from. So he gets who Jesus is better than anybody else. In fact, we'll see that in a moment. But I love his reply. The Roman soldier says to Jesus, look, 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 look. I get that I don't deserve to have you come under my roof. He says, in fact, you don't even need to. Jesus, if you just say the word, he'll be healed. If you're really God, I get the time and space and matter don't limit your authority. In fact, you could say, be healed right now, right here in Xenia, and that person be healed in Africa. Why? Because if you're really God, time, space, and matter haven't limited your ability. You have authority over all things. Now, this is a big deal because I need to pause and just ask you, is your God limited? And this is a big deal. Why? Because I'm not going to let a limited God put me back together. And yet you and I let limited people who don't know the inversion of you try to put us back together every day. We surrender our parts to other people all every day for approval. Like, am I good enough? Do you like me? Am I successful enough? We surrender those to people every day 
and yet they're incapable of being unlimited, and yet here's the Roman soldier who says, I get that you are the unlimited God. You are the only one who can restore my servant. And again, I'm asking the question, is, does your view of God, of the unlimited God, who's outside of time, space, and matter, who's the good God, who's the personal God, who is the creator God, who could do anything at any point in time? Or did you shrink down with the humans? Sometimes our God's too small. Now, let's pause, because while we're here, we all know this is a nice theoretical message. Tomorrow, you get that phone call that grandma's dying of cancer. The theoretical becomes very practical. And do your prayers in Xenia have an impact on grandma who's in Colorado who's dying of cancer? Or is God limited by time, space, and matter? Or does God even have authority over cancer? I mean, I wrestle with that at times. I, it just seems like cancer's killing everybody out. We got a phone call. One of my best friends in Columbus this week said, hey, I went in for gallbladder tests and found out I've got stage four cancer, probably dying in six weeks. I went, what? And I just kind of said, God, once again, this, this C word just seems from my perception. It's just, I'm being honest with God. It seems like the C word at times feels bigger than you are. This is why discipleship step number three, guard your heart, is so important. Why? Because we can know that God's all powerful. We can know that God's that big. But sometimes it doesn't feel that way, right? And so I got to guard my heart with the truth that, hey, even when it doesn't feel like God's loving, and even when it doesn't feel like God's good, that God is bigger. He's, he's got this. And so at the end of my prayers, I need to either recognize the truth that either God's got this or he doesn't. I'm not going to continue to let this plague my mind. I'm going to surrender to God because either he's got it or he doesn't. And again, this year, are you giving your pieces to the eternal God who can fix anything and everything? Or to a temporal being who says, I don't know what you should have looked like, but this is a good idea. All right. So we have this moment where he says, look, God, I understand authority. I say to my servants, they go here, they go there. I say to this one, go that way, they go that way. I get it. You don't have to come. Just say the word. It'll happen. I love Jesus' response. Again, not Romans, Matthew. All right. Jesus, when he heard this, was amazed. This is really cool, by the way. This is the only place in all scripture where somebody amazes Jesus. Now, it's amazing that Jesus, not in the sense that he's like, oh, I didn't see this coming, right? That's not Jesus, right? But rather, Jesus is amazed in the sense of, wow, of all the people who are following me, of all the people who love me, of all the people who are Jews who are supposed to get this, it's the Roman centurion, the one who isn't supposed to get it, who gets my authority and power. And that amazes Jesus. I just find it amazing that the only person who amazes Jesus doesn't actually get listed anywhere else in Scripture. It's not Peter. It's not John. It's not even the Apostle Paul or anybody else in all Scripture that normally follows Jesus. The only person who amazes Jesus is a Roman centurion who understands the authority of God, isn't limited by time, space, and matter, understands that God, if he is God, Jesus that is, if he is God, has authority over everything. I love it. Which gives me hope. Right? Because sometimes I feel like there are people who I haven't studied near as much as I study that when all of a sudden they start talking about God, I'm like, I think you may understand him better than I do sometimes. Right? Because there's that childlike faith piece. It doesn't mean we shouldn't have knowledge or reasons for what we believe. It just means that there's also a place where we just go, hey, either God's got it or he does. Either he's good or he's not. Right? And when you talk to the four-year-old, he doesn't go, I don't know if God's good or not. He's like, yeah, Jesus loves me. How do you know? The Bible told me so. <laughs> that really is a good answer. It's just not the one I have, right? And again, it doesn't mean we should throw out all logic or all intellect or the guardian of our heart. It just means that sometimes there's that place where it's like, hey, let's go back and remember the very basics. And the very basics is that God is a good, loving God. 
who's going to take care of us. Doesn't mean it's going to be the way we want it to or how we want it to or even look like what we want it to. But he's a good, loving God who's going to take care of us. Now, here's a piece of the passage that is a little like, whoa, what just happened? And it reminds us that there's two kingdoms. Again, Matthew, not hurts. No idea why that happened. Right? I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and will take their place at the feast with Abraham, Jacob, and the kingdom of heaven. So it's going to be a bunch of people who come, gather. This is about the end times. And they gather for the feast. All right, talking about they come to heaven. But the subjects of the kingdom are going to get thrown outside into the darkness where they'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's a positive Jesus sometimes. The fact that Jesus never lets all the grace out without truth is a little way we should work too. Right? Because truth without grace is pretty difficult to swallow. And grace without truth doesn't really transform anything. Okay? And so Jesus said, hey, don't forget that there's going to be a day when there's some in and there's some out. We're going to come back to this. I don't want to, this is where I want to land, but I don't want you to miss the end of the story. Because, you know, it's like, did the guy get saved or not? Did Jesus answer him? Did Jesus smack him upside the head? What happened? Well, Jesus says, all right, go, let it be done, just as you believed it. And at that moment, the servant indeed was healed. Why? Because God's authority is not limited by time, space, or matter. God is good and is able to do anything God wants. Okay? Anybody with me? All right? So we pause for just a second before we come back to the question and remember that our faith is founded in a person and event. The person is Jesus Christ. The event is the popsicle stand at Golgotha. I was just testing you. There weren't popsicle stands at Golgotha. I would go, boy, it's like, what is this? All right. The resurrection is the event. All right. We found our faith on these two things. All right. And ultimately, then we go, hey, with this person who existed and died and was resurrected, I want to have a healthy, intimate, passionate, growing relationship. All right. And this is the person I want to reassemble my life. Why? Because he is the God who reassembles. That's the whole point of the resurrection. I take what was dead, I can take what was destroyed, and I can make it into something beautiful again. What was created in the image of God, which was broken and destroyed because of sin, I can rebuild because of my resurrection, because my death was the atonement for your sin. My resurrection gives me the ability and the authority to say, I am the great reassembler. I think that should be a like Jesus shirt. Reassembler, right? All right. So let's go back to our passage where he says, hey, there's going to be some out. And there's some in. Now, why is this important? Well, because if I said to people, hey, what's your number one reason you struggle to trust Jesus? A lot of people would actually say, well, it's because I struggle with your God in hell. You struggle with my God in hell? No, your God and hell. What do you mean by that? Well, you claim to have a loving God that I should be willing to surrender all my life to and allow him to reassemble. And yet your God, the God of love, sends people to hell. How could a loving father send his kids to hell? If it's really as bad as you say. Yeah. Right. Good answer. God doesn't send people to hell. It's a choice. Right? Uh, uh, let me give you a, a way to explain this. Okay? Uh, if, if uh, I'm going to pick on you a little bit. How we go? This is your boyfriend, right? Hey. What's your name again? Hayden. Hayden, welcome. I'm going to pick on you very first Sunday you're here. That way you know you're loved. All right. <laughs> so Hayden, all right, about a couple months ago, so I was like, I'm going to love that girl. I'm going to force her to love me. And so he devised the plan to kidnap her. <laughs> By the way, that's how he got here. It's her first day out of the basement. Okay. And uh, in the process of kidnapping her, every day he says, when you finally love me, I'll let you out of the basement. But until then, I'm going to force you to love me. Is that going to work? That's not what love does, right? Love invites, love woos. Love says, please see my goodness. See how I'll care for you. Know that I'm going to take care of the pieces of your heart you're going to give and entrust to me. And I want to be part of God's work of putting you back together. Which, by the way, my teenagers in the room, this is why it's so important to date someone who loves Jesus doesn't mean you're going to get the right guy. It doesn't mean he's going to be good or the right girl. It just means you got a better shot at it, right? And if you throw that piece out, you got no shot at it. 
Okay. Now, here's my point. All right? God doesn't force someone to love him. And so God doesn't force you to be with him in heaven. Because that's what heaven is. Heaven is where we hang out with God. So God doesn't ever force anyone to be with him. And so if you don't want to be with God, why would God force you to be with him eternally? That doesn't sound like a loving thing to do, does it? So God's not going to force anyone to be with him and love him for eternity. So when you say, hey, I struggle with trusting God because of this issue, I would say to you, hey, that issue is one of the reasons why I trust God. It's because God doesn't force anyone to love him. And in the, we don't want to be with God. God's not going to say, I'm going to force you to be with me forever. That's how much I love him. Because that's not what love does. Right? This is why we say, okay, well, who's in and out? Who goes that? Who's out? All right? Because I feel like the story sometimes goes, who's the last kid picked? Well, there again, we have a dysfunctional view of God. It's not a soccer game where God went around and said, you get to come to heaven, you get to come to heaven, and you are going to hell. All right? You probably to hell too. But that's not the way this works, right? Right? I wasn't really saying you're going to hell, baby. God doesn't pick who's in and who's out. Right? How's it work? Well, let's go back to what does it mean to follow Jesus? Someone who has a healthy, intimate, passionate, growing relationship with Jesus Christ is the definition of a Christian, all right? And again, we use this definition because there are a lot of people who say, oh, I believe in Jesus, and I go, oh, great. What does that mean? Well, I believe that someone historically existed. I don't think that's what the disciples meant when they said, do you believe, right? They meant you have to follow Jesus. That's what Jesus' invitation was, come follow me. And so we define it this way, all right? So Jesus invites all people into a relationship with him. It's not a soccer game or, or some kind of a school a kickball game where he, he picks and chooses, right? Jesus says, hey, I want everybody. I want everybody. In fact, Scripture says the reason that Jesus has delayed his second coming is so that more would be able to believe in him, right? But love doesn't force anyone to reciprocate their love. And what we end up with then is the invitation of all Jesus is open as long as we're alive. And in fairness, this is questionable theology, this last part, possibly even after we're dead. And I just want to claim for you that it's questionable theology because I don't know. Because when I read a scripture, I'm like, God, it's kind of a door open that even possibly after you die, you could still choose to receive the grace of God. But I don't know. And it's questionable theology. What I do know is why gamble on questionable theology? Let's just get it right while we're still alive. Right? Because ultimately, we're not talking about what happens when we die. We're talking about receiving the gift of eternal life now, and that now God is in me, and now God walks with me, and I get to do life with God now. Why would I wait till I get to heaven to hang out with Jesus? But I can receive the joy of it now. So my gamble is not going to be on to possible theology. My gamble is going to be on what we know theology, which is right now, while I'm still alive, I want to invite you to follow Jesus. All right? So the first step to reassembly is receiving the invitation that's given to you and everyone else to follow Jesus. Jesus says, come follow me. you got to go, I'm on board. Let's go. In fact, the invitation to follow Jesus doesn't demand you change a single thing. Did you know that? Your first step to Jesus is simply to go, wait, I need Jesus. I think I would like to have a healthy, intimate, passionate, growing relationship with Jesus and allow God to begin to overwhelm you with his grace, with his presence, with his glory, with his goodness, and with his justice and righteousness as well. All right? And so what we get then is the question, okay, so if I follow Jesus, how good do I got to be to not get kicked out and be on the out group instead of the end? You see, all I did was sit there and walk through my head going, all right, what would be my next question here? What would be my next question here? What would be my next? Well, my next question would be, okay, so if I want to follow Jesus, what happens when I mess up? Because if you're like me, you're like, I'm going to mess up. <laughs> I mean, it's just a matter of like seconds, right? I'm going to mess this up, right? Well, the principle of grace operates and says, hey, I don't, I don't obey because God's going to get me. I obey because I'm in love. Because I don't want to harm the relationship. I remind people every day, I don't try to do the right things with Sarah because I'm afraid she's going to get me, although she's scary. 
I do the right things to take care of Sarah because I want her to have a great relationship. I love it when Sarah is happy. I love it when Sarah is enjoying life. And so I don't have behavior because I'm afraid she's going to leave me, but rather because I want the relationship to be as good as it can be. This is how our relationship with Jesus is. Okay, which is countercultural because in our culture, even love for most people is if you if you behave correctly, I'll love you. If you do this for me, I'll love you. In fact, some of us have been in relationships where we kind of felt that, right? If I was just good enough, I could have a right relationship, right? All right, so the first step is admitting that we need Jesus, right? The second step right, is accepting the grace that's made available to all. Okay, you can choose to accept or reject it, right? And God's grace, all right, was given to us when? While we were still his enemy. Okay, this is I'm just helping you have a, a healthy view of God. We're going to climb back in and start doing some really intentional scriptural studies, all right, in about two weeks. So right now, I'm just, I want to formulate what it means to live in a biblical worldview. Why? Because it should change everything for you. It should change every relationship you're in. Now, let me give you a negative view. There's a show going right now where this is one of the main characters, and he says, God's love is not simply given. You have to earn it. Step by step, you have to grow. Now, again, you and I have been in relationships where we go, I can see that. In fact, you and I right now know people who attend a church that's got so many rules, and they don't want to break any of those rules. Why? Because they're afraid that what? God is going to get them. You have a friend right now who that was their theology, and that's why they walked away from the church. Because they finally got so tired of trying to live in all the rules that they realized they couldn't live under the rules, and so they found the relationship with God to be oppressive and not plain. But this is incorrect theology. You can't earn your way into the body of Christ. You can't earn love. And survey says, I really like when I get to do the fun stuff with PowerPoints. Just humor me, okay? Humor me, all right? So why is this important? Well, we could argue that because that's the end of the story for everybody. But I would argue it's not about what happens in the end. It's about what happens now. It's about the relationship where you're walking or running with God and with others now. How does that change everything? Well, again, we'll go back to, all right, if God's going to put you back together, Lydia, who do you get to be mad at? I don't know, whoever you're more self-righteous than, I guess. Right? But if I'm going to choose to say, hey, God is my God. He's putting me back together. He's going to be like, why are you mad? Who's it really hurting? So what? So forgive them. What? Because Jesus made the, the most scary scripture. And all the Bible is when Jesus says, hey, if you don't forgive someone, I won't forgive you. What? That's a terrifying passage. Because I want to be like, no, they deserve to be punished. And God's like, then let me handle it. It's not your job. When you become righteous enough to punish someone, you can do it, but you're not going to get it. So I want to learn to live with the grace of God now so that I can enjoy the fullness of life now. Because it changes Every, even when you hurt me. Think about that. Even if you hurt me and you come and you, 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 you harm me inside in ways that I should be angry, I should hold a grudge, I should just be destroyed. Someone who has a healthy, intimate, passionate, growing relationship with Jesus takes all that pain and in a healthy way gives it to God. He comes it back out and moves forward. It changes everything. Our correct view of God changes everything. Everything. So, again, here would be my next question. Okay, so what do I got to believe to make sure that I'm on the end? Because surely it's not just about a relationship. Well, that's fair. In our first service, you know, we have two Pauls. And they both have a last name that starts with an M. Which is really confusing at my house because one of the will be like, Well, hey, Paul said, and we'll be like, wait, which Paul? Now, why would you do that with Paul? Because one of these Pauls loves shooting guns and used to be a barber. And I, he kind of walks and lives like this. The other Paul's kind of like free and happy and just he'll help do anything you want. This other Paul, don't ask him. He's a nice guy, but that's not what he's going to do. The other Paul, you could ask him for like, hey, I need that coat. He'll give it to you. All right. And, and here's my point. When we start talking about allowing God to put us back together, sometimes 
my fear is that we don't have the correct view of God, and so then I'll allow anybody to put me back together. And what I mean by that is, well, how do I know you're not talking about the God of Islam? Because aren't they all the same? Don't all roads lead to the same place? Well, no. So, first of all, we have to say truth exists. Core beliefs of Christianity, truth exists. Okay? And therefore, we have a correct view of God, which means that the God of Islam is not the same God of Christianity, is not the same God that the Buddhists worship. Right? And so we have the God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Then we have the idea that miracles are possible. Okay? Because if I'm talking to someone and I want to convince you about the, the grace and glory of Jesus and his resurrection, if your worldview says, well, miracles aren't possible, there's no way I'm going to convince you about Jesus' resurrection because it's a miracle. And by the way, when someone says miracles can't exist, what should be your first question then? How did all this get here? Right? Because science says there was a big bang. All, everything came out of nothing. <clears throat> everything came out of nothing. It's a non-repeatable event. It's a miracle, even in scientists. Right? And so every scientist I know who trusts science actually says that miracles could happen. I saw the Christian worldview, miracles are possible. Jesus Christ incarnate lived, died, and was resurrected. Right? Jesus claimed to be the only way. So now we got to wrestle with what Jesus said about himself. Right? The Holy Spirit exists, all right, and is guiding us still today. And the Bible is the Word of God. So these are just kind of core beliefs of Christianity. That if you said, "Well, who's in and who's out? What do I got to believe? What's the basics that I have to know about God?" I would say, "Well, here you go." And there's more we could add, right? But but once we start adding a bunch, we start to lose the relationship piece, right? And this is more of the intellect piece. Okay, we need to know some things, and some things are extremely important. All right? But but let's not overwhelm someone, all right? If you're here today going, I'm still trying to figure this thing out. Okay, here's the core. Okay. And so let me just close with a couple of thoughts. How do you understand God? Well, I like this idea of kickball. Okay. And here's an argument. It wasn't mine. I got it from somebody else. And they said to me, this is how I view God. And I went, wow. And they said, I view God as the captain of the kickball team. And every time you break a rule, he kicks you out of hell. You're never allowed back on the team. And he goes, isn't that the God you serve? And I went, well, not really. He goes, yeah, but if I don't live right, God's sending me to hell. I said, well, if you don't live right, you're actually choosing not to follow God. And if you don't want God, so you end up in hell. He goes, but yeah, that's semantics. He's like, what you're telling me is that there's a God who's in charge of the kickball game, and if I don't play right, I get kicked out of the kickball game, and I get in hell. Right? Here's my little kickball. Oh, See that guy's kicking the ball? Oh, I'm just, I'm going to play this, and you're like, oh, that's kind of funny. All right? And I said, no, that's not the way it works. I said, you've set up a, 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 a proposition, a picture of God that's not accurate. And then you made it an, an either-or proposition that, that isn't really an either-or proposition. I said, let me give you a different picture. All right? I said, first of all, the kickball analogy is going to really struggle here, but I'll work with you. Players have to play by the rules. That's what God, that's why we have rules. We have boundaries, Right? And if Doug kicks the ball, and let's say Doug doesn't need his walker, but Doug suddenly kicks the ball, we all know that Doug should do what? He should run to first base. Well, what happens when Doug runs to third? If God's the captain in charge of the kickball game, God doesn't kick Doug out into hell. God has to stop the game, though. Why? Because the rest of us don't know how to function now. Why? Because Doug's not playing by the rules. Right? He's not doing what God wants him to do. So Doug ran to third base, and it's like, what? Will the ball get him out? Do we all pause? What's the person at third base do? Do they run him over? Yes. Now you see, God invites us to behave in a way that we love God, love others, love self. When we don't do these three things the way God wants, suddenly we have to pause the game. Why? Because it harms every other person out there. It like makes us go, I don't know how to play now. When suddenly Doug behaves selfishly or doesn't obey by the rules, suddenly everybody else has to pause. And so it's suddenly like, I'm going to hate Michelle. Michelle, who's walking around normal, suddenly she's like, I don't know how to deal with this. Why? Well, because that's not how God wants us to behave, hating each other. Does that make sense? But God doesn't kick Doug to hell. God stops the game and says, all right, let me show you what we did wrong here. Let me show you. And so, well, yeah, but, but the devil may come back and say, well, hey, you've got to kick him into hell. And God says, wait, I'm not going to kick Doug to hell. I've taken his punishment already. I died on the cross for his sins. 
whatever punishment Doug deserves, I already took. I just need to teach Doug through grace how to do it different. I'm transforming him through grace. Now, if you don't want to play this way, that's fine. You don't have to keep playing by God's rules. If you want to self-quarantine away from God, that's fine. But these are the way God sets the game. Well, does that make sense? Again, it was a crude explanation, but he brought the kickball thing in, so I thought I'd stay with it. All right? Again, your view of God changes everything. And so let me just close with this thought. It's in our discipleship book, right? And this is what I think. When you're hurting, when you're broken, when you're at your worst day. So everybody think of your worst day possible. You got it? Your worst day you've ever had. Okay, some of you are still working on it. All right? You got it yet? Worst day, worst day you've ever had? Okay. Okay. How do you approach God? Uh, Mr. Jesus... I don't really feel like you like me right now. I don't really feel like you care. If you have the time, I just want you to know I'm really messed up. I screwed up. Everything else is screwed up. If you have the time, could you even check in on me? Is that really a biblical view of God? You see, and if I had that view of God, I'm not giving him all my parts in 2022. What you just said is, first of all, I don't know if you got time for me. Then I don't know if you really care. And because I don't know if you got time or really care, I'm not going to give you all my parts. I'm going to give you a different view, God. It's worth it. You're already be, you can't even make it to the door. God has to leave the house in the storm, because you're in a storm of life, it's your worst day ever, to come find you. He finds you instead of scolding you like you may deserve. He picks you up, wraps you in a blanket, carries you to the house. Now God and you are both drenched. God takes your coat off and hangs it up. Takes you over by the rocking chair in front of the fireplace. Wraps you in a nice warm blanket and begins to hold you. Now you're confused. It's your worst day possible, right? You're just mad at everybody. Including God. Right? And as God's holding you, you're like, God, wait, if you really love me, if you did, things aren't as they are, I'm just mad. God holds you and says, I know. It's okay. Hey, but God, things aren't right. Don't you care? I mean, that, this should not have happened. And God goes, I agree. Somebody didn't play by the kickball rules. And that's how all this mess happened. But what if I'm mad at you? It's okay. You acknowledge I have the power to fix it. But I'm not always going to act like Santa Claus. The things are not as they ought to be. So my question for you is, which view of God do you have? Because one of these pictures, you're going to give God everything and say, I trust you, you can put me back together. One of them says, I'm not going to give you a dang thing because I can't trust you because I don't really think you're a good, loving, caring father. What's your view of God? Are you going to give him your parts this year?